Are you making one of the most common social media mistakes that prevent your business from growing? Are there easy opportunities you're missing to get more clients? And what's the first thing you should do if you want to pivot your niche? You're about to find out. Welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. My guest today is John Brewer. He has those questions and I'm excited to answer them. John assists high-performing individuals in transforming their success strategies, emphasizing the importance of well-being through his coaching venture, Authentically Led, and his newsletter, The High Performance Paradox. You can find him on Twitter at Lead Authentic, where he shares insights related to performance, personal transformation, and his skill for selecting the ideal GIF, or GIF, depending how you want to pronounce it. I have never know. In addition to his coaching role, he's an executive in the mental health field, a practicing clinician, and an academic professor. He has awesome questions that I'm excited to get into. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Hey, Josh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. This is the first time we've actually spoken, but I feel like we've gone back and forth on Twitter all the time. So I'm sure we feel like we know each other, even though this is the first time we're actually getting to know each other. I, I love your questions and I've got a bunch to say about them. So let's get right into it. Tell me what the first thing you want to know is. All right. So first question is, as a coach who create content instead of a content creator that's trying to build their business doing that, what do you think is the most common mistakes that coaches make when using social media? So I love this. And before I get into my thoughts, I'm always curious when people bring me questions, what's going on in their own mind behind those questions and why they want to ask those. So let me start with this sort of, are there any mistakes that you think you're making that you feel like you're making that you wonder if you're making? What, what made you want to know this? Yeah. Yes. I'm sure I am making plenty of mistakes, but I think the other part is the most common like writing advice or social media stuff is either like how to grow your audience type thing, but not necessarily how to get clients or how to grow your business, <laughs> just how to get more followers. Or it's all writing advice on like how to be a better storyteller, but it's I want to make sure that connects to then getting to the client side of things, not just to be a great writer. I don't, that's not my thing. I don't want to do that. Yeah. The fact that you're thinking that you're already ahead of like 95% of what people are doing on social media, because you're absolutely right. Like I've had conversations all the time with people where they're like, oh, I, how do I get to 10,000 followers? And I'm like, well, why do you need 10,000? What's your goal? And they're like, oh, I want more clients. Okay. Like how many clients can you work with? I don't know, maybe 10. So what do you need 10,000 followers for? It's like, you need 10 clients and you should be optimizing your strategy for that, not 10,000 followers. And to your point, you can do all the writing is an incredibly valuable skill and it's super helpful. You should be optimizing your writing for your goal, not optimizing your writing for what's going to get a bunch of likes or shares or engagement or whatever. There's definitely overlap there, but I do think that most people are not asking the question that you're asking. And by the way, as a result, you see all the time people who are quote unquote successful, they build an audience, they get followers, they do, they get likes, impressions, whatever, but they're not getting any clients and they wind up super frustrated because they're going, I'm doing the things that everybody told me to do. And that's when you wind up with people going that like social media doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work. I did all that. It's no, you're doing it wrong. You're optimizing for the wrong thing. And there's a great Gary Vaynerchuk used to say this all the time, and it's a great line. And he would say, what's the value of a basketball? And he was like, to me, the value of a basketball is nothing. To LeBron James, it's a billion dollars. That's the yeah. thing with social media, right? It's if you're using it in the right way, it's incredibly valuable. If you're not, it's not that valuable and it's a big distraction. Well, let me ask you another question. Is there anything that you find particularly frustrating about social media right now? In terms of using it, not just consuming it, which is a whole other thing, but, but uh, I was going to say, yeah, I think one, one is always battling the algorithm, not necessarily mm -hmm. in the part that a lot of people are talking about with reach and things like that, but also just what gets fed to you and then who you're interacting with. That part has been challenging because I get the most random stuff that I always see where I'm like, I don't want to engage with that or see it. So the yeah. mute button's been a frequent user lately. So that's been a challenge. And then the other one is just trying to figure out that content strategy of what really lands with people that's going to convert to the person that wants to do more in their lives or feel better about what they're doing in their lives versus I could post some random clips that I have a thought of and I'll get a lot of engagement yeah. on, but I'm like, that's not the audience that I want to curate at all. So as far as curating your feed as a consumer, because again, that really in terms of social media in general, aside from posting has a huge impact on the value that you get out of it, right? What's coming your way. 
One thing is, and I think you mentioned this, be very careful what you engage with because those are all signals, right? So you'll see sometimes a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to this guy's post because I want to support him or I'm going to retweet this because I want to support her or whatever. That's all fine and that's nice, but you're also sending a signal that you want more of that. So you want to be careful what you're engaging with and deliberate with that. The other thing is if you're not using Twitter lists are super powerful because they're basically algorithm breakers. Another thing you can do with Twitter lists is a lot of times people will just create like a big massive list. One thing that I found interesting to do is you can create sort of multiple mini lists. So if you have a list of five or with only five or 10 people on it, it's very easy every day to go through that as opposed to I have a hundred people in a list and it's even if it's curated and maybe better than your original feed, it's still different. So one thing that I had done for a while was I literally had, I labeled my lists by day. So it was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. And on each day, I had five to 10 people that I would add. So basically, it ensured that all of those people, I was going to see their stuff at least, everything they had posted at least once a week. And I would just go, oh, it's Monday. I'm going to go look at my Monday list and scroll through and know that I've seen everything that those people have posted. Understanding, obviously, the common way to do lists is like you just theme it by topic or whatever. And that's fine. That can be really helpful. But realizing that, oh, there's different ways to use lists to filter that out and ensure you might have a daily list where you're like, I'm going to check this one every day. And these are the people I want to see every day. And these are the people that I'm going to check once a week and want to see what they're doing. And these are the people that I'm going to check once every two weeks or whatever it is. The list can be really powerful. But again, like all social media, it just depends on how you use it, right? Any tool is only as good as your ability to use it. So jumping back to the mistakes. So I put together a list of the six most common mistakes that coaches make when using social media. The first one is they have no specific goal. Likes are not a goal. Views are not a goal. Followers, honestly, on social media probably should not be a goal. If you don't know specifically what you want to get out of social, you're never going to get it. If your goal is to get clients, your entire social media strategy should be designed to get clients. Likes, not followers, not any of that. And you're always optimizing for that. The second mistake I see is a way too vague of a target audience. If you don't decide exactly who you want to reach on social, how are you ever going to attract? And I think this is another mistake I see people make where it's like they just the vaguely, I want to grow my audience. Okay. And even if you drill down and go, I want to get clients, who specifically, who are you talking to? Who are you trying to attract? And in your content, in your post, again, optimize for that. You're talking to those exact people and you don't care about anyone else. And maybe that's a very small niche and maybe it means you're going to have a small following and that's fine. You also might be, for example, you might decide if my goal is to get clients, that really what I need is I need social media as a way to start relationships and that your goal is you're posting things that are designed to create interactions, one-on-one interactions, whether it's direct messages, whether it's replies, whatever, and you're optimizing for that. The third mistake that I see people make all the time is posting about yourself instead of your target clients or target audience. No one cares about you. They only care about you in in regard to how you can help them. Even when you're sharing personal stories, your stories may be about you, but you're sharing them to help your audience. So even your personal stories are about the audience, not about you. And I think personal stories are great. And I think that's, again, where people sometimes go wrong because they're like, oh, it's helpful for people to get to know me. And that's true. It, It is helpful, but you want them to get to know you in the context of it helping them. So everything should be framed with that in mind. The fourth common mistake I see is posting things that have no value. And by that, what I mean is value is transformation. If your post doesn't help your target audience get from point A to point B, it's not valuable. You want to post stuff that is helping people that you specifically want to help with the specific transformation that they want to make. You're not a celebrity. You're a coach. So coach. I think a lot of people model their social strategy. They look at people with huge followings and they go, oh, I should do what that person does. But most of those people, first of all, a lot of those people with big followings, they didn't get them on social media. They got them on TV or movies or running some massive company. You know, it's funny, like you'll take Elon Musk, right? Everyone goes, Elon Musk is so great at social. Is he? Elon Musk has followers because of Tesla. But people look at it and they go, I'm going to do Elon's social strategy. Go build Tesla. 
and then you'll have followers, right? So be careful who, who you're modeling and what you're modeling of them. The fifth mistake I see all the time is using too many platforms. You do not have to be on every social media platform. I think in most cases, you should use one or two. It's fine to have an account on other platforms in case someone's searching for you there. But I think actively trying to be on every platform is a huge mistake. To succeed on social media and grow and whatever you want to accomplish, getting clients or audience, whatever it is, takes a lot of time and effort. And focusing that time and effort on one or two platforms at most, as opposed to spreading it across a bunch, you're going to wind up growing much faster on one platform than many. In fact, the more platforms you use, the slower your audience will grow, the fewer clients you'll actually attract. And then the sixth and last mistake that I see all the time is a one and done approach to content. One of your goals should be to maximize the value of anything that you post on social. Remix it, repurpose it, repost it. If you create it, post it once and move on to the next thing, you're leaving a ton of value on the table. This is also why people flail and go, oh, it's so much work, it's so hard, it's so whatever. Yes, it is a lot of work, but part of it is you're constantly creating new stuff. And really what you should be doing is putting new stuff out there to see what resonates. And when something hits, using it over and over and over again. For example, you could set out and you could be like, my goal is to create 90 social posts that work, every, that are hits, that I know they're hits. And I'm eventually, it's gonna take, I might have to post 300 things to get to the 90 that work but I'm gonna track the hits and I'm gonna keep, and every time I get a hit, I'm gonna repost it every three months or I'm gonna do spinoffs, you know, so that you can eventually get to a point where you're barely posting new stuff at all, but it's just, and everything you post works and everything you do is a hit. The other thing that I would just say about this quickly is to also keep in mind that it's not just reusing social posts, but everything is content. So everything you do is content. An email exchange you have with a client, a question, whatever, that can easily be copy and pasted or just slightly tweaked and become a social post. When you start to, a conversation you have with someone can become a social post. A snippet, if you record your coaching calls or for clients, a snippet of something you said to someone, you say, hey, I'd love to share this. I think more people would benefit from this can be social posts. So when you start to get in a mindset of everything is content, it's very different than, oh, I need to find time to sit down and create social content. Yes, you can do that and should do that. But I think most people are creating way more content than they realize. They're just not transferring it over and using it. And they're not taking the hits and reusing it. They're not building a content library. They're just doing what I call random acts of content. And that's a huge mistake. Any questions about any of that? That super resonates though, especially the reusing of content. Also being a newer, I have my account's only a year old. And mm -hmm. so the audience has changed too. And so I repurposed some content very recently that got like crickets early and then resonated quite a bit yeah. this time. And I was like, oh, I need to do that more. I'm glad that you mentioned that because the other thing is I think people sometimes have a hard time in their own mind assessing like, okay, what is a hit? Did this work? And you have to understand is you don't have to go massively viral for it to be a hit. If you have a small audience, you're not going to get that much traction. But if your usual post gets zero likes and this one got two likes, that's a signal that something resonated. I should probably try that again. And to your point, your audience is growing. New people are discovering you. But also, even if your audience stays the exact same, because of the algorithms and reach, the majority of your audience never saw it. They just didn't see it. So that's another reason to post again, because in your mind, you're going, well, I already shared this. They already all saw this. But if you remember that, like, well, maybe 10% of them saw it three months ago, maybe. Yeah. So it's 90% of them didn't see it. I can tell you, I repurpose stuff all the time. And I have never once had anybody say, why are you sharing this again? By the way, I've repurposed stuff that I don't remember and I created it, right? I'll go, oh, I don't even remember like saying that because I kept track of, oh, that was it. And I'm going to, you know, post it again down the road. And I'll go find it and be like, I don't even remember saying this. And I created it. So you think your audience remembers it? No chance. And the other thing I would say about this that I heard someone say that I thought it's a little bit of a stretch of an analogy, but I actually think it's, it's a good analogy. He said, but compared it to like when you go to a concert, you want to hear the band play the hits that you've heard a million times. It's not, oh, I've heard that song, play the new stuff. I've, I've had even people that 
do remember, they've heard me say that before. They like the reminder. They like the repetition. It's really interesting because we all think that, by the way, this goes into promotion of anything, right? Let's say you're doing a launch or you have a special offer or whatever. We're always like, I don't know. Like I've been taught, I don't, I just posted about it yesterday or I just, I mentioned it in my last three email newsletters. Am I really going to mention it again? And it's like, yeah, you should mention it again. The more you do, the more both the repetition and people are just not paying attention. There's so much more you can get out of what you create than what most people actually get out of it. And that's, yeah, that was the other thing I was thinking on that list that, but I wonder with a coach or someone that has the product or service that they want to sell or even just a newsletter to sign up mm -hmm. for or whatever, how often should they plug it? Because like you said, for me, like I plug my newsletter once a week, but it, I'm like, oh man, people are probably sick of seeing that every week. Yeah, more. Probably more, it's certainly more than once a week. I think when it comes to promotion on social, here's a key point. One of the reasons why people are hesitant to promote, besides feeling like, oh, I've already told people about this, is they worry or they feel like that promotional post isn't providing any value to people, that it's just sucking value out of them. And there's a couple of things to think about. So one, promotion is not a selfish act, it's selfless. If the thing that you're promoting actually provides value to people, you're doing them a favor by making them aware of it. You're not asking them to do you a favor. So that's just a mindset thing. But so the second thing is you can promote in ways that also provide value. So for example, when I'm promoting a new skill session, and this is something I just started a few months ago and immediately saw sales go up. So I used to do, I'll promote it a couple times and okay, that's it. Now, every day for a week in every platform I have, and sometimes multiple times a day on social, I'm going to promote it leading because usually the price is half off for the first week and then the price goes up. So that week is a sort of all out promotional blitz, but I'm not every day just going, oh, buy my new product, buy my new product, buy my new product. What I'm doing is I'm making each of those promotional posts valuable in themselves. So I'm sharing an excerpt from the product and going, hey, here's a clip that shows you how to do that. By the way, if you want it, you can get it here. So that applies to everything. So you could actually promote your newsletter every single day by taking excerpts of the newsletter or excerpts of the previous newsletter and creating a sort of a valuable piece of content or post that's then promoting the newsletter. In this week's issue, I'm going to talk about X, Y, and Z. Here's one of the thoughts that I'm exploring, blah, 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 blah. Or in this week's newsletter, I'm sharing 10 suggestions to help you become a better leader. Here's one of them. And what happens with that is not only do you feel better about the promotion, it's actually more effective promotion because people are more likely to like it. They're more likely to want to check out the newsletter. They're more likely to share it. They're more likely to engage with it, all of that stuff. So I always say the best way to promote a product is the product itself. Give people pieces of it. The other thing that you can do is, so one thing is you can promote with excerpts value of, of the product. But the other thing is you can create stories where it's tangential. For example, let's say that one of the topics you wanted to talk about was how to overcome your inner critic. And you were going to write a post that's when that inner voice bubbles up and says, you're not good enough to do whatever, here's what you should do. You could do that same thing and insert a reference to the newsletter. Every week when I'm about to publish my newsletter, I hesitate because I hear that inner voice telling me it's not good enough. Here's what I do to counter that inner voice. So you've basically done the same thing that you were going to do, but by referencing the newsletter, it's subtle promotion for the newsletter. So that's another easy way to do it is look for those opportunities to tie in stuff. And now again, that you could easily be promoting your newsletter every day in some way without feeling like I'm just every day going to get my newsletter. So it's just being more creative with it and trying to think about how can I make this post valuable to people besides just making them aware of the newsletter? Yeah, no, that's really good advice. Cause I think about that from the coaching side too, of integrating, like you said, when you want to get clients as a coach, yep. write about how you coach and it's integrating that into the content of, I worked with a client last week. Here's what we worked on. Here's the stuff. A we thousand percent. Of, here's my product. Hopefully you buy it. And, all, and also when you think about it, most of the content that you're going to share is in some way coming out of things that you've coached people on. But what's interesting is people share the lesson and don't mention the coaching. They go, oh, one of the exactly. things I always tell people is blah, 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 as opposed to going, I had a coaching call with this person who was a whatever, and he was struggling with this, and here's what I told him to do. 
you're just wrapping things in these cons. And by the way, this is not just social. It includes, it goes with newsletters too, right? You can incorporate these sort of subtle references, for example, to your coaching service. If you're going to, if your newsletter is going to be about whatever, how to, how to become a stronger leader, you can write the generic, how to become a stronger leader, or you can literally have a line towards the beginning. One of the problems I see most often in my coaching calls is people struggle to be a strong leader and coaching calls is a link to your coaching page so that it's impossible for them to read it without knowing you do coaching. So it's those little subtle things that can make a huge difference. Okay. Let's jump into your second question. What is the next thing you want to know? So the next question is, so my coaching business is definitely not an outbound type coaching business. I've rarely found outbound clients. All my clients have been referrals and I'm considering now scaling up my business a little bit more. I've moved some things around, opened up some time, and I'm wondering what you'd recommend uh, as far as a way to expand that pipeline of potential clients. Cool. So I know you said your clients have been referrals. So is that in terms of how you're currently getting clients, is that pretty much it? It's word of mouth from people that you've worked with, or is it people discovering your newsletter or social or where are they coming from now? I've gotten a small percentage of them from, yeah, social or even just they found my content, we engaged in the DMs, but oh, the overwhelming majority is I just have a lot of friends in the executive space and consulting mm -hmm. space and things like that, that then refer coworkers, things like that. Okay. Have you ever gone on podcasts besides this one as a guest? This is my second. And I, I am a skill session member, so I will be listening to that podcast. Yeah, watch the podcast booker. So that's one thing that you can definitely, definitely do. And even beyond that, get reaching other people's audiences. So whether it's a podcast, whether they have a newsletter, whether they have a whatever cross promotions or figuring out ways that you can get in front of, of more people is a simple, obvious thing. The other thing that I would say is, it's one thing to look for new methods to get clients. It's another to go, what is the thing that's working now? And what would I have to do to double? That? So for example, if the majority of your clients are coming through executives that you have relationships with and that kind of thing, it's an interesting thought exercise to go through and go, okay, if I had to double that method, what would I do? Is it more conversations with people? Is it an email to all the people I know saying, hey, you may not know this, but I have blah, 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 blah. Is it referral fees? And there's a million things that you can experiment and play with. But a lot of times with growth of anything, business, audience, whatever, we always tend to look for the new thing as opposed to going, this is actually working. Even if it's not crushing it, it's working on some level. Are there some easy things I could do to double that or triple that or 10x that or whatever? And a lot of times there is because you already know that on some level that's working. So as opposed to going, let me find this new channel, this new whatever, it's maybe I can amplify this. Chances are for you and for all of us, we've rarely maximized what's working. There's usually room to amp that up. So that would be one of the first things that I would consider. The other thing you said, you remember my skill sessions, which is great. Uh, I have a skill session called the client generator. For anyone listening to this, you can go to joshspector.com slash sessions. It's all about how to get clients. And I walk through a bunch of things that you can do. So I recommend checking that out. The other thing I recommend, and we'll put a link in the show notes, is I have a blog post on my site, joshspector.com, that's literally about how to use a newsletter to get clients. And I talk about, I know you already have a newsletter, which is great. Anyone who doesn't have a newsletter, you absolutely should have a newsletter. But there are specific things you can do within that newsletter to increase your ability to get clients from it. So I won't go into a lot of those right now, but you can read the blog post and check those out. But what I do want to talk about is a little bit here about alignment of messaging. And so specifically as relates to newsletter and getting clients. And, and I went to your website before the call and I was looking at a couple of things. And specifically what I was looking at is the comparison between your newsletter description on your signup page and your coaching service description and how much they match. And the reason why I'm looking at this is because ideally you want them to be, if not the same words, pretty close. Because what happens is anyone who's signing up for a newsletter that's described in a way that matches your coaching, that alignment is there. Doesn't mean they're gonna hire you, but they signed up because they want that thing that you also offer in your coaching. If those descriptions are very different, then you might be growing a newsletter with the wrong people. Maybe some of them are interested in it and maybe there's obviously some overlap, but you really want it to be, if that language resonated with them enough to give you their email address, 
you have a much higher likelihood that they're going to be interested in your coaching services. So I want to share a couple of things based on what's currently on your website. Your current coaching description is on one of your coaching service pages. You say, as a coach specializing in performance leadership and personal development, none of those words appear in the newsletter description. So performance leadership and personal development. Now you say some other things that are roughly similar, but they're not the same. Maybe that means changing your newsletter description. Maybe it means changing your service description, but some of those words should echo each other. Then another thing you say on the coaching description page, you say, my mission is to empower you to build a life that resonates with your deepest convictions and desires. Then your newsletter description says, we explore the tension between peak productivity and personal well-being. Productivity is nowhere in your coaching description, right? They, they're just... Then you say, on the newsletter description, you say practical tips and insights to thrive in both without compromising one or the other. Learn research-based strategies for sustaining energy, focus, and fulfillment from the inside out. Now, you're talking about things, they're similar. I've seen a lot worse. I'm not saying that this is bad. You're in the ballpark, but I do think there's an opportunity there to align that messaging. And going a step further, those words that you choose should also probably, I didn't look at your Twitter bio or at social bios but they should probably be there too. So that there's this repetition so that whatever the people that are resonating with one are gonna resonate with the other. And this goes arguably all the way down into your individual posts. There should be certain words that you use to describe things. And these are just choices. There's no right or wrong, but you might decide that I talk about, am I gonna use the phrase high impact or high performance? It doesn't matter. But when you're talking about things that relate to that, even in a social post, you're always going to use those words, right? It's almost like creating a style guide or a voice guide for the way you talk about things in your language. And that alignment, while it's a little thing, I think can really help ensure that the people that are coming in into your world are going to resonate all the way through, that there's not a disconnect. So with that said, I've got three creative ways for you to attract new clients. And this is beyond the usual stuff that everyone's like, oh, you know, post more on social and engage with people and send cold emails or what. let's get sort of different than that some, with some out of the box ideas that maybe you haven't thought of. Okay, three creative ways to attract new clients. So number one, invite your previous clients to gift a mini version of your service for free to someone they know who would benefit from it. This is basically like a testimonial on steroids. So let's say your typical coaching service is a three-month coaching package. Go to someone that's done that, that had a great experience, and say to them, hey, as a thanks, I'm doing a free one-off coaching call. Anyone you think would be helpful for it, you can give it to them as a gift. And what you're doing is, so that person's going to go, number one, it's great. For, they're going to be like, oh my God, that's so cool. And they get to feel like they can do a nice thing for someone. They're going to give it to the person that they think is most likely to find what you do valuable. So they're doing the sort of finding the right person for you. And then when they do it, that person that you do the call with is not only getting a free call, they're getting a free call with the sort of stamp of approval of their friend who was like, I worked with John and he was amazing. Yes, you have to put in a little time to do the free call, but there's a high likelihood that person's going to find the call valuable and that they're a very, they're a very warm candidate to potentially become a client and a high percentage of those will probably convert. So that's the first thing that you can try. The second thing is you can offer a one-time free version of your service so people can sample it. And so what I mean, there's a couple different ways to do this, right? So one is you could just do a free group coaching call. Your coaching is usually one-on-one. -on -one. You could go, you know what? On this day, I'm going to go on Zoom. Everyone's invited. You can ask me questions. We can do whatever. And it's just designed to give people a taste. And so they can get a taste live, but also you record that video, you post it, and now you have a resource that people can show what you do. In many ways, this podcast is a showcase for me. You can see how I work with people, how I think, how I talk about stuff. And it works in that context. It's why... This show is primarily people interviewing me and not me interviewing other people. I don't want to showcase their ex expertise. I want to showcase my expertise. So you can do a sort of free one-off group coaching call like that. But here's an even more clever example or way to do it. Again, let's say that you offer coaching and let's say it's typically like a three-month coaching program or whatever it is. You could find a client that you feel strongly that you could help and take them on for free. Full three months, free deal. But all they have to agree to is that you can record the sessions and release them as a podcast. So now people can have a whole season of the podcast 
which is a series of coaching calls you had with one client so people can follow along this journey and see the transformation, see exactly what your coaching service is. There's a narrative story that people will hopefully get, get hooked on. And all it's cost you is the time you invest with one free client. And now you can use that in a million different ways. You can attract an audience. And again, this is another example of getting back to the best way to sell a product is the product show them what it is. So that's the second option, right? Can you figure out a way to offer, do a one-time free version that you can then leverage in different ways to draw in clients? Then the third creative way to attract new clients is create a show where you interview potential clients. So this is awesome if you know the types of people that you want, but you have trouble getting to them. So you're like, I want CEOs of these types of companies. But what am I going to do? I, I'm just going to send them a cold email and be whatever. What, they're going to ignore that. But what they're not going to ignore or what most of them won't ignore is the opportunity to be interviewed. So for example, let's say your dream clients are agency founders. Then create a podcast or a newsletter where you interview agency founders. And in your own mind, this is not about, you don't care about growing the audience. It's nice. It helps, whatever. What it's about is an excuse to get one-on-one -on -one interactions with potential clients. And you can literally make a list. You could sit down and you could go, here is a hundred, not types of people, but here is a hundred specific people that I would want to be clients. And I'm gonna create a show and I'm gonna email these hundred people and say, hey, I would love to interview you for this show. And you're not pitching your services. You're not doing any of that. What you're doing is it's like a networking ploy, right? You're getting in front of them. You're interviewing them. You're learning about them. They're flattered to be interviewed, whatever. Maybe on the show, you're asking them about their struggles, their problems, their whatever, right? You're not solving them, but you're getting like the ultimate market research on how to pitch them. And then after the show, you go, hey, you were talking about how difficult it is to manage your team. That's something I actually help people with if you're ever interested. So I guarantee you, if you reach out to a hundred of those people, 10 to 20% are going to say yes, maybe more especially depending if it's people that haven't been interviewed a lot, like everyone's flattered by people want to hear from mm -hmm. them. And of those 10 or 20, a couple of them are probably going to become clients. Yes, it takes a little time and effort, but if you can identify the types of people that you want, it can be really effective. Any questions about any of that? No, that's a, it's a good combo though, of what you talked about with doubling down on what you're doing. Cause I yep. have a pretty large network of executives and all of that stuff. And Actually, my coaching services have been filled up by them, but I, I have that worry of that pipeline is going to drop, right? Like they only know so many mm -hmm. people. There's finite things there, but I guarantee I can connect with them who will connect me with other people yep. who, if I, it's like that approach where you're right, like, you could combine the two, go to former clients yeah. and be like, Hey, I'm doing this podcast or again, new. And by the way, like you can do it in whatever, it doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be a newsletter. It could be, a, let's get on the yeah. phone for a 15 minute call or whatever. It's just a way to get your foot in the door and say, Hey, I'm looking for people to interview. Who would you recommend? And again, they get the, what is it? The sort of the boost of being, it gives them an excuse to reach out to some of these people too and go, Hey, I know this guy, John, he's looking to interview people for blah, blah, blah. Are you interested? Yeah, it's, it's really, it can be really effective and it's amazing. And I say this as a former journalist, right? It's amazing how you can get to people that you would otherwise never be able to get to this just a, and this is a totally different thing, but I used to be a journalist for the Hollywood reporter and I covered movie studios and stuff. And I used to have, there were a couple of studios that were on my beat and I used to have monthly lunches with the heads of these studios. Now, these are people that everybody in town is trying to get time with and can't get time with. Estab producers, stars, all of this stuff. And yet I was able to every month sit down and have a lunch one-on-one -on -one with heads of studios. And I was a nobody. But because I worked for a press outlet and because I covered them, that was able to happen. Now, that's obviously a slightly different thing. But I do think it's an example of you will be shocked at the people that are willing to talk to you if you want to interview them and feature them versus I want to pitch you something totally yeah. different. And how that just creates the pipeline. Because again, those people yep. that are referring to me, I didn't actually work with. I, I either yep. had worked for them or I did a project for them or something like that. Yep. And But they're the ones that hold the money that then say, hey, mm -hmm. employee B, here's someone that needs to help you because you have some performance issues or whatever it is. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. So let's get to your third question. What is the last thing you want to know? Yeah. And so this one would also go back to the alignment you were talking about with the website newsletter and stuff is mm -hmm. so my coaching 
career has definitely been specialized more in the leadership space for healthcare execs. That's my mm-hmm. bread and butter, what I've done my whole career and all of that. And through working with that, I've now looked at pivoting my niche a little bit more. And so with that, I want to pivot, to help others overcome that burnout side of things, create that life that's holistically driven. What advice do you give to people when they start pivoting that niche? Obviously, you don't need to just declare it, mm-hmm. but they're alignment's going to be one of them, I'm guessing, but there's got to be more than just that. Yeah. So I would start here. I think a definition of the terms, like we all, including myself, we all talk about, oh, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to pivot my this, that, or the other. And I think it's important to understand that there's three different things here, right? There's a difference between a pivot an expansion and a contraction. And so I think the first thing to understand is which of those things are you actually doing? Are you pivoting? Are you expanding? Are you contracting? And the way to think about that is moving forward, are you, and I'm going to use the word teaching, but this means service, you know, helping whatever service you provide. Are you providing the same things to different people, different things to the same people or different things to different people? So how would you, with what you have in mind, which of those resonates? Yeah. Very similar things to different people. Okay. And additional people or you're no longer going to do it to these people. You're only going to do it to these new people. Yeah, it's more of just an expansion. So additional right. people, some okay. other stuff. So th- I think it's funny because these are minor details, but it's important in your own mindset, right? Because yeah. we get in a mindset of I'm pivoting, meaning I'm abandoning this and whatever. All you're actually doing is expand. And more specifically, you're expanding your ideal audience or ideal clients. So I think keeping that in mind as you approach this is really helpful. And so with that in mind, if you're going to pivot your niche or expand your niche, I think there's four key questions that you want to consider. The first one is, why do you want to pivot? Why do you want to change? Is it for business reasons or personal reasons? Business reasons, meaning obviously you think it's a better business move. It's going to make more money. Personal reasons, you're just tired of working with the people that you've been working with, or you're interested in work. You're excited to work with other people. And there's no right or wrong here. But I think it's really important to think through for yourself and understand, okay, I'm going to expand my ideal audience. Why am I doing this? And it might be a little bit of both, but I think it's helpful. Even if it's both, I think it's helpful to go, this is the primary reason. Like I want to do both, but I'm primarily doing it for business or I'm primarily doing it for personal. If you're primarily doing it for personal, you want to make sure, are you prepared to take a step back? shrink your audience potentially, shrink your client base, right? If you're doing it because my interests have shifted and my interests are over here and I want to help those people, that expansion, that shift, that pivot, whatever it is, even if it's a contraction, that may impact your bottom line. It may impact your audience. It may impact a bunch of things in the short term negatively. So you just need to be sure that, okay, I'm going, I'm doing this for personal reasons. It might short term not be great for business. But that's a calculated decision that I'm making and and is okay. On the flip side, if you're primarily doing it for business reasons, you want to ask yourself, are you sure you're excited by the new direction aside from the potential results? Because a trap is, I'm going to make this shift because it's good for business. I think it's going to be good for business. And maybe you're right, but you don't want to work with those new people. So you wind up succeeding and then being miserable. So whichever way you're doing it, making sure that you sort of, I'm going to make this shift. Here's why I'm making this shift. I'm okay with the good, bad, or otherwise that's going to happen in the short term, that may happen in the short term from doing this. It's just a way to pull apart and think through this decision as opposed to a lot of people just going like, all right, I'm going to pivot. And like we said in the beginning, you're not even going to pivot. You're actually going to expand, which is different. The second question I think it's important to consider is, and we talked a lot about alignment before. But what's the alignment between your new messaging content and offers? So if you're going to expand, some language is probably going to change. Language about who you help, how you help them, what the transformation is, and just thinking through what is that new language? How does this change things like my bio, my my product descriptions? Does this change the content I'm creating? And what are these keywords? What is my voice guide going forward about how I'm going to talk about stuff? So that's something to think through and make sure you have that alignment. The third thing to consider if you're going to pivot your niche is what's the story behind the shift? So you may tell this publicly, you may not, you may tell it subtly, but it's worth thinking through why are you making this shift? And starting with the truth, right? For yourself, of this is why I'm doing it. And then how do you message that to people? 
if someone comes back to you and goes, I don't understand, you used to always talk about leadership and now you're talking about performance, what's the deal? You want to be able to talk about that, both reactively to questions you get and also proactively. So if you do go on podcasts or you do in social posts or newsletter or whatever, you can tell this story. There's a story to be told behind any pivot or expansion. That can be a million different things, but it could be as simple as I've spent years helping medical healthcare people with X, Y, and Z. And then I had a friend who wasn't in healthcare, but had these same problems. And I told him to do X, Y, and Z, and he did it and it changed everything. And it's made me realize that what I'm actually teaching is relevant beyond healthcare. And that's why I'm expanding, right? So creating a narrative that explains why you're doing this, which will help people, both existing people buy in and not make it feel like, oh, he's just onto something else that's not relevant to me anymore. And it will also help new people understand why is the healthcare guy talking about tech founders or whatever, right? It's like, no, this is actually creating that, that narrative arc. The next thing is, and this is the last of these, is you want to ask yourself, how are you going to judge if this pivot or expansion is working? And I think it's really helpful to, at the beginning of anything you do, think through, okay, I'm going to make these changes. What does it look like? What, what are the signs that I'm looking for? Because it's not as simple as, in some cases, it may be more clients, audience growth, more money, more whatever. But it may not be. It might be less. It might be like, you know what? I want to work with fewer clients and charge more. Or I want to work with, for example, for me, I pivoted my business a bit a few years ago from 90% consulting revenue to more of a products model. And over the course of three years, this year was the first year that the majority of my revenue came from products, right? So it's gone from 90% services to now this year was 59% products. So that is a metric that I was able to look at and adjust. Is this working? Is this, is this shift working? How am I going to know? And I think that's really the question to ask yourself. How are you going to know if this pivot, if this expansion is working? And understanding that metric, it doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be clients. It could be satisfaction. You could go, you know what? A year from now, I'm a lot happier with the people I'm working with now than I was the people I was working with. But understanding for you, I think it's really helpful because again, then you can optimize for that. And then you can avoid the frustration of, oh no, I'm making 10% less this year than I did last year. You didn't optimize for money. You said working was about, do you like the clients you're working with better? Then it's working. The money is a separate issue, right? So I think those four questions are worth spending some time thinking about before you, you shift your niche. Any questions about any of that? that no, that part's really, as you were going through, I was like, already running through and it does help mm -hmm. for especially as i because whenever you think of shifting that niche or whatever it's, do i need to make this announcement that i'm doing there or anything like that mm -hmm. and it's not really but there could be some really cool content around why the shift and mm -hmm. like for me the shift is i did a lot of leadership in healthcare and but i see a lot of personal leadership skills that need to be developed in a lot of other sectors where you wouldn't traditionally think of leadership mm -hmm. and so it's just the opportunity and a diverse amount of clients, but it's, that's an easy and cool story to tell too, probably. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing too, that I think is a good, I'm obsessed with words in general. I think they, word choice is super important, both to ourselves and how we express stuff to others. So I think the word evolution, the idea that what you're doing is not a shift, it's an evolution. And when I talk about niche in general, I always talk about that a niche is always going to evolve. And I think one of the reasons people are hesitant to embrace a niche is because they think it's like a lifetime decision and they're stuck. But once you realize that whatever your niche is always going to evolve, might expand, it might contract, it might actually shift. So with that in mind, that what's actually happening here is that your niche and your approach and your business and who you want to work with is evolving. And I think when you talk about it, if you think about the people on the other end, if you are going to tell stories and you are going to talk about it and, and, and explain that stuff, I think explaining it that way is helpful because you're not saying to people, hey, you came into my world, you're following me, you're paying attention to me for this thing, and I'm quote unquote shifting into something else. You're saying, no, this is the next evolution of this. And for some people, they're, gonna, they're not going to care. But I think understanding that this is evolving versus completely pivoting into something else, and especially because that's the truth, going back to what we said in the beginning, you're not actually abandoning stuff. You're just expanding and, and evolving into some more stuff. So I definitely think that's how I would approach it. The other thing I would say is don't feel like sometimes 
people feel like when they're gonna pivot or shift or any of this stuff with their niche, they feel like they need to make this like big announcement. They need to be like, and now everything has changed. And it's, you don't actually need to do that. You can do that. And there may be circumstances at which you want to, but you certainly don't need to do it right off the bat. So one of the things you can do is you can just start going down this road without saying anything. And it just evolves. And maybe at some point you say it and maybe you don't. I've told this story before, but when I first started my, my newsletter seven years ago, it was much broader. It was much more like self-improvement. Like I was, yes, I would share stuff about here's how to grow your newsletter, but I'd also share stuff about like, here's how to have a better night's sleep. And I'd also share stuff about, it, it was the description was even like how to learn, do, and become better at your artwork and life. So basically everything. Like it was very broad self improvement and then eventually, after a couple of years or whatever, I started niching down and really just focusing on the sort of creator audience business growth stuff. I didn't make an announcement of that. I just stopped sharing the sleep articles and kept sharing the other ones. And, over, and I don't think I ever actually made an announcement about it. It just shifted. And as it shifted, some of those people that loved the sleep articles and had no business or weren't creators or whatever, eventually went away. They self-selected mm -hmm. out. And, but I had changed going back to the alignment piece. I had changed my messaging. I didn't make an announcement, but I changed the description on the signup page. I trained, changed the words that I used to talk about what I do, all of that stuff. So the new people that I was attracting fit that. The old people, some of them that liked the stuff I wasn't doing anymore went bye-bye. And the other ones that it fit for stuck around. So I do think sometimes people overthink it and feel like, okay, I've made this. It can be good to tell a story and I'm not saying not, I'm not saying to do one or the other, but you shouldn't feel a pressure that I have to go, Hey, everything's changed. You can just gradually change and let it play out. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think of that comment you made right away of everything's content. And so yep. it doesn't need to be like an announcement. You got my wheel spinning for sure. It doesn't have to be an announcement, but it can totally be about with human performance and stuff like tell the story of how this impacts people and, and yeah, and there, there's, you can create right. so much there. And, and there's right, exactly. And there's a reason why you're wanting to go this direction. There's a difference between a social post that's about, I've realized I can help more than healthcare people and I'm excited to do it. And this is why that's different than I'm going to email my whole list and go, a shift has now happened. Either get on board or go away. Those are like, those are totally different yeah. things. And by the way, in some scenarios like that, I don't think this is your scenario, but in some scenarios that actually makes sense to do, right? If you're really pivoting and right. really everything's changing, yeah, you might as well go, everything's changed. Are you with me? Or, yeah. Are you with me or against me? But yeah, I think telling the story in other ways and social and in, as you talk about stuff and, and all of that, and even tailoring some of that message to your audience, right? If you're going to go on podcasts, the podcast that's aimed at the sort of healthcare field you're going to play up the healthcare stuff. And the podcast mm -hmm. that's aimed at a broader audience, you're going to go, my background's in healthcare, but I do this. Like, it's funny. Like I talked about working for the Hollywood Reporter. My background's in the entertainment industry. I don't ever really talk about it. But if I go on an entertainment related show or I'm talking to an audience, then I'm going to talk about it. So you can pick and choose your messaging tailored to the audience in those situations that you know who the audience is. Okay, John, thank you for these questions. I appreciate them. They gave me a chance to think about and explain some stuff that apparently was in my head, but I haven't really talked about before. And I'm sure people, or I hope people will find helpful. For people who want to know more about you, check out your stuff, where should they go? On Twitter or X or whatever you call it nowadays, I'm at Lead Authentic and then HighPerformanceParadox.info for my newsletter. For me, my newsletter for theinterested.com slash subscribe. My skill sessions, joshspector.com slash sessions. If you like any of the stuff that I've said today, you'll love my skill sessions. I have, like I said, the client generator. I have one called the niche definer, all about defining your niche. The podcast booker is a, a guest session that I had Christina Nicholson do recently that explains how to get booked on podcasts. They're all one hour videos that are super tactical and stuff that you can use to accomplish those things. That's about it. I'm also on Twitter at Jay Spector. If you would like to come on the show and ask me three questions, just go to joshspector.com slash questions to submit them. And that's more than enough out of me. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone for watching and listening. I will see you next time.